Thanks for coming. Uh, 15 years ago, my father came and gave a, not exactly the same slideshow, but uh, he packed the house that <laughs> night. People were possibly uh, violating fire code marshal. <laughs> 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 Some people care. And uh, uh, my my dad would be pleased, but somewhat puzzled that people would come out and want to hear about the war, uh, the, his experience in the war, and uh, it it just uh, it, it wasn't that interesting to him. He couldn't understand why other people were that interested in it. And it. It wasn't that he was particularly traumatized by what happened to him, it's, and it's not that he wouldn't talk about it, but it was, um, you think about it, he was 18 years old in 1940, and um, uh, at that time he was in his last year of gymnas. Gymnas is, is kind of the equivalent of high school, and that's supposed to be a fun year. In the springtime, when it happened, you're, you're, you're ramping up for the, the end of the school year, the end of your school experience. And uh, it's, it's supposed to be a fun time. There's this thing called the Rus, and uh, some of you know about that, but it's, a, uh, the, it's kind of senior year antics. Uh, and uh, my dad was looking forward to that. He was uh, elected, uh, uh, editor of the Rusevis, the, the Rus newspaper, and uh, he was looking forward to that. And then, of course, on uh, April 9th, 1940, almost 75 years ago, uh, that all changed like that. And um, uh, I will move to the first slide here. This first picture is not one that he took. It's kind of a stock photo of German troops uh, marching through Oslo uh, in the uh, first couple days after the invasion. And just to, to back up, um, I think most of the people in this room know the, the context of uh, the invasion of Norway, but you can't assume that all the time. Uh, Poland had been uh, invaded in, in the fall of 39, kind of divided up between Germany and uh, Russia. Uh, the Winter War was going on in Finland, where Russia had attacked Finland, and that's quite a story in to, to itself. Uh, in the spring of 1940, things were very tense. Uh, there were uh, in the days leading up to April 9th, the uh, British had invade, uh, uh, violated Norwegian neutrality by laying mines in the coastline outside of uh, in the waterways, and that was controversial. And um, uh, there was there was a lot of tension in the air. Norway wanted to stay neutral. They'd managed to be neutral in World War One, and they wanted, you know, war was brewing, they wanted to stay out of it, and they thought they might be able to, being on the, the northern end of Europe. But uh, the Germans attacked uh, simultaneously uh, around the country, and uh, on April 9th, the paratroopers came, they came by uh, boat, uh, and it was an almost complete surprise. Uh, uh, the Norwegian Air Force, small that it was, was mostly shot up on the ground. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the military hadn't mobilized. But there was scattered resistance. Um, the king and the, uh, a number of high-up government officials immediately fled to the north. And where my father was living was um, uh, an hour north of Oslo, a town called Eidsvall. And if I wasn't missing the slide that my dad put on the cover, that would be the one I would show next. And this, uh, 
shows a bridge that was sabotaged and uh, demolished by Norwegian forces as uh, they fled to the north to delay the German advance. Uh, and the Norwegian uh, officials came to Eidsvall and they held a meeting in the school where my dad was a student and my grandfather was uh, uh, a teacher. And this, this is the school, this was taken later, uh, probably some weeks later, because the Norwegian officials fled north and then the Germans came in after them and came to the school and they set up in the school as a barracks and a field hospital and uh, there was a skirmish outside of uh, town. My dad heard rumors about it and he lived near the school and he was poking around the school when he saw uh, uh, a truck unloading dead soldiers uh, uh, and taking them to a storage room in the school. And, and he, that was the first time, he was 18, the first time he'd seen that kind of uh, side of war. And those, those images of seeing, seeing those bodies stay with him uh, the rest of his life. Um, so the Germans came in and a friend of my dad's took this photo and the next one when the Germans had left. So they had... Uh, they kind of ransacked the place. They left behind this picture of Adolf, and they staged some rotten herring that they found there. They were trying to make a nice little, a nice little photo op. <laughs> okay, I listened to a tape that my of my dad when he was here 15 years ago. When he came to this photo, he said, as a former teacher, uh, I'm going to ask you, who are these people, what are they doing, and why are they doing it? And uh, there were some uh, snappy answers there. And some of you, those of you who heard the answers 15 years ago, need to be quiet. What's going on here? Radio. Not making bombs. Radio. radio. Yeah. What about the radio? Illegal listening. Yes, illegal listening. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell where they're doing it. This is uh, in a neighbor's hen house. There was a farmer who uh, had had a radio. Uh, the radios were. Uh, early in occupation, they were all seized except for members of the Norwegian Nazi party. And you had to turn in your radios under the threat of arrest. And uh, the farmer didn't, uh, he turned in his radio, but this one he got a hold of after the war had started. And uh, every evening at 7.30, the BBC broadcast in Norwegian came in. And they would, different people, they would take turns sneaking down and listening to the BBC. And uh, it started off with uh, Beethoven's Fifth. And that was very evocative for my father. And um, there would be news, and they were, of course, starved for news. The, the newscasts would always, would often end with, nonsense phrases, which were kind of code to the Norwegian underground to give messages about where uh, people would be smuggled ashore or where airdrops might be. And my dad remembers hearing them say stuff like, uh, you know, a, 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 a line from a folk song, Raven var uta med rumpa so long, the fox was out with his tail so bushy, you know, stuff like, just stuff like that, so you, you, you remember that. Um, one thing, so this was just a, a few minutes away from my dad's house. Also, there was a, the school was close by, and early in the war, uh, there was a German sentry uh, posted just 
just down the street from from uh, my dad's house, and he and another friend, my dad remembers when they went and you know tried to talk to this guy, and this guy had been obviously instructed to be friendly, try and come across as reasonable, and uh, uh, so they would come and practice their schoolyard German with him, and the, the, the guy would talk about how they were just, the Germans were just trying to save them from the English, Jewish, capitalist uh, juggernaut, and um, my dad's friend, if it, as this escalated, ended up, you know, yelling at the sentry, you know, uh, uh, Hitler is an idiot, Hitler is an idiot, and, uh, you know, it, and this was something of, that would happen, would not happen later in the war, because, uh, as my dad said, people would get arrested for uh, much less than that later. And then there was also the thing of the cold front, uh, where the Norwegians would simply not engage, not talk to, um, not talk to Germans at all. And this happened in my in my dad's house, where for a lot of, of uh, people were forced to house German soldiers, or usually they were officers. And there was a, for some months early in the war, there was um, a German officer who came and lived in their house. And my dad says he was an educated man, a reasonable man, and in different circumstances, it would have been fine. But he was an occupying German, and they froze him out and they just wouldn't talk to him. They wouldn't acknowledge him. And, and as some of you might know, Norwegians can be pretty good at this. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear, I've heard that. <laughs> OK, um, you know, the, the, the Germans kind of wanted to win the hearts and minds. Uh, although they, they they didn't go about it in in a very reasonable way, but uh, the Norwegian Nazi Nazi sports ministry uh, proclaimed, you know, what what are Norwegians like skiing? So let's have a national ski day and have ski races around around town. The Norwegian youth will like that, right? So this was the National Ski Day in Gatesville, and my dad participated in it, and they went to the starting line, and then they skied for a while at kind of a lackluster pace, and then uh, a certain, at a certain point they just stopped like this, and they wouldn't go any farther, and then they, they sang uh, patriotic songs, the national anthem, and uh, uh, that was that. It had, it had to be called up. There was you know, nothing that could be done. Okay, here's my, here's my favorite picture. Um, uh, as I think is not uh, surprising, uh, Norwegians take great pride in their skiing. Uh, and uh, making fun of foreigners on cross-country skis is an uh, enduring quality. I don't know if any of you have seen, a, uh, there's a Norwegian reality show called Alt for Norge, uh, where Norwegian Americans who've never been to Norway compete to go to Norway and meet their relatives, and they have to endure a number of trials, one which inevitably is put the Americans on skis and, you know, uh, hygiene ensued. Well, uh, this was no different in in uh, eighth fall for my dad, and they they enjoyed seeing the the master race bubble around on skis. And uh, my dad saw this guy, and he saw them at the at the top of a hill. And uh, my dad knew the terrain and had a pretty good sense of where he was going to go down. And, Positioned himself so that when the inevitable happened, he popped out and took that took that photo and got out of there. Unfortunately, he was he was not armed, or 
I might never have been born. Uh, <laughs> he did, as my dad said, he shouted some uh, some words at him that they hadn't, he hadn't learned in huh? school. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this was Sidney Mike, uh, 1941, and a celebration of national days and nationalistic celebrations were, were forbidden. And as probably a, a lot of you know, Sidney Mai is the big uh, national day for Nor Norwegians everywhere. Uh, in Portland, too, it's the, for Portlanders at Norse Hall, there's a, that's where Norwegian, American, and uh, other people uh, uh, sympathetic or interested or roped in go on a, on a parade from 11th and Coots to Lloyd Center and back and uh, waving the flag and singing songs and with police escort and it's quite a spectacle. Then uh, this is what it, it was banned so it went underground and this was at my grandparents house and um, uh, this is my grandmother here and my grandfather there, uh, and my dad is up there. And uh, I don't really know what went on, but I think it's a safe bet that uh, speeches were given at some, some point in the, in the evening. Now, um, the thing I'll say, just mention in passing, is this is 41. Uh, the next year, uh, less than a year after this, my grandfather was arrested, and uh, he was one of the Norwegian teachers that resisted the Nazification of the schools. And uh, my dad, in probably 1998 or 1999, said, oh, by the way, I've got the diaries that he kept when he was in the prison camp that summer in, uh, up in Sjeikenes. Uh, above the Arctic Circle, uh, I'm like, what? You've got these diaries and you've never told me about them? And uh, uh, he's like, yeah, but they're, you know, they're boring. They're, <laughs> he just talks about uh, being hungry and uh, uh, the uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen and just talks about that over and over again. And, you know, who would be interested in that? Well, I, I was interested in that. And we, it became a, a translation project, and um, it, uh, um, I was, I, it was a presentation here uh, a few years ago, and some of you were here for that too. Uh, this and that, I'm going to just throw this out there, that until very recently, as well as, uh, this is the booklet that my dad made under the swastika with these pictures and, and the story, were for over 10 years, maybe 12 or I don't know exactly, were hosted by a website called Info Norway, uh, that, where it was just free and available to the public. And at a presentation like this, I would say, go to Info Norway and you can see the picture of the bridge, or just you can read more back backstory, we could read about my grand, you could read my grandfather's diary. Info Norway blinked out a couple months ago, so uh, I'm looking for another web hosting uh, uh, thing, so if you have any bright ideas about that. I just confirmed yesterday with the guy who used to do it in Norway that it's, it's gone and it's not coming back. So, uh, that's that. Okay, this is a a picture from uh, Oslo, and it says uh, action against the university, and this is uh, uh, Germans surround the university buildings in Oslo, and by this time, uh, in the fall of 1943, my dad was a student at the uh, University of Oslo, and um, he was, uh, on this November day, he was studying in the library, and there was um, uh, a note that was passed hand to hand from student to student that said, the Germans are coming at 11. You know, get out. 
And my dad saw that, and he was just like, there were so many rumors, so much misinformation, or he just, he couldn't take it seriously. Uh, but as it got closer to 11, uh, it became more restless in there and louder. And then he just, he's like, man, I'm out of here. And so he, he was, it was before 11, so he went and, and looked out and saw the Germans coming down. This is the old uh, uh, university uh, building right by National Theater, right up of Karl Johann's Theater. And he saw them, and then he ran down the basement, popped out the back, and started climbing a fence, but saw the barrel of a gun and gave up. And he and uh, uh, I've seen some accounts, it's 1,500, say there, other, my dad said later it was 1,000. They all got rounded up and sent uh, south of Oslo to a place called Larve, and they were put in kind of a dirty building that had, had Russian prisoners in it right before they were in there. And uh, that night they slept three to a mattress, and but they were still, I don't know, they didn't take it that seriously. And they ended up being there for some weeks, and they didn't take it that seriously uh, uh, until they started uh, sending uh, uh, groups of students to Germany. You didn't want to get sent to Germany. Uh, and the, there's also, there was a pretense to the arrest, and that was that a, a, a building had been set fire by the students, and uh, it, it uh, it was a pretense, kind of like the firing of the, the, the Reichstag building in Germany as a pretense in Hitler's rise to power. So it's kind of like they were doing the same trick there. So, uh, this is, last time I was in Norway, my daughter and I found this uh, a memento to the, they called the German students, and there were 30, they were roughly 30, of November 1943. So 650 students we were deported to Germany. And uh, my dad was not in that number that was deported. And it came down to this. He was grouped uh, in a group where he went through a selection. And he had a fever. And the Germans were uh, uh, quite concerned about disease and spreading disease. They didn't want to send sick people to Germany. and. Uh, so he was pulled aside, uh, and he was in limbo. He was still, they said they were going to just send him later when they got better, but he ended up being sent to uh, Grini, and Grini is uh, known as the, the largest uh, concentration camp in Norway. And uh, when he was sent there, his number was, this is, a memento that someone made and gave to him, it's a napkin holder, I guess, on his birthday, uh, October 3rd, 1944, and it has his, his number, 9446. They did not have their numbers tattooed on them, as you've heard about more uh, notorious concentration camps. Um, so, he ended up, yeah. Uh, Santa Grini is uh, northwest of Oslo. Uh, in, in, then it was farmland, now it's suburbs. Question. Yeah. May I? Where you said there are 650 students went to, uh, to Germany and sat there in, in prison. Were they released? And did they come back to Norway? Uh, <coughs> the ones who lived came back. Uh, it's kind of interesting what happened to them. My dad says that they were being kind of groomed for being uh, indoctrinated and to be ambassadors, but it didn't really work out. They, they were given a little bit better food, given better treatment, because they were trying to you know, just get them to go on, on, on the side. But uh, the ones who died, died of disease, being on close quarters. Okay, when, when my dad came to the uh, concentration camp, to Grini, uh, he says on the first day, 
uh, there were a couple things that made a big impression on him. One was an old timer with a, a three digit number, uh, you know, kind of told him the ropes, told him what the deal was, and said, uh, here's something else. You need to be careful about what you say to someone you don't know or you don't totally trust. And that, that, that guy said, one out of 10 people here in Yadini is an informer of some kind or another. So you really need to watch what you say. And the Germans were mm, masterful and kind of uh, pitting people against each other. They put you in certain groups and then with no reason put you into other groups and kind of keep you after each other. Now, Yadini was not like uh, the concentration camps that are in a, most people's uh, uh, idea of what a concentration camp is. It was not like uh, uh, Auschwitz or Tuberlinka or you know those in Central Europe. It was more detention camp. Maybe more of a detention camp. Uh -huh. it, w it wasn't a death camp. Uh -huh. uh, and but it was it was no fun, as my dad would certainly uh, say. But the thing is that. His brother-in-law went to one of those camps uh, and had one of those experiences that you hear about. His brother-in-law was sent to a camp in Poland called uh, Stutov, which was a sub-camp of Auschwitz, and he had one of those experiences that you heard about. And so, in some ways, my father felt like he didn't really even have a right to talk about it because the experience he had, as you will hear, is no fun, but it wasn't like that. Uh, the thing that the, the two things that my dad said were the worst about it one food being hungry all the time and the other thing is just not knowing not knowing and the, the Germans that was just part, part of the deal how they, how they did things this is a critical part of, uh, of the experience in the, the, the barrack that he was in and this is a, a drawing taken out of a book that my dad had. And these are potatoes, you know, not, not very nice potatoes, not new potatoes, but they're potatoes. And this is the food lottery. And um, uh, there was a representative in for the barracks that was kind of uh, in charge of this and had other duties. They were called the Indemon. And uh, my dad took a turn at that. And this is what they had to do. They had to make these rows of potatoes all equal, or as equal as they could. And then they had a lottery which went with the bump number, and then you go pick them out. And uh, if somehow it felt that uh, the potatoes were not being dealt with uh, in a fair manner, that was uh, highly controversial, as you can imagine. Uh, but food, yeah, food was an ongoing thing. Uh, they would, uh, depending on where they worked, they, they, they worked uh, during the day and into the evening in various parts around there, but they sometimes had access to, you know, uh, uh, scraps of bread or potato peels uh, that the Germans had thrown away, and they would, it is kind of a delicacy they made out of uh, potato peels. My dad talks about one guy in the course of his uh, work outside of the barracks that day, found a dead crow, and he came back and he cooked it, and it was delicious. <laughs> he didn't share it with my dad. <laughs> okay. Um, here's um, uh, a particular guy that uh, was illegally playing the fiddle uh, in the evening. And the, the Germans kept them really busy. They didn't have much free time. Uh, even after they came back from uh, work, uh, they would have busy work in the, in the barracks, kind of like cabin inspection, and the Germans would come in and inspect, and they'd say, no, that's not, doesn't meet the standard, and throw it down, and make you do it again. They did have free time. They had, uh, they had to stand up and be counted three times a day, and sometimes they would just leave them standing there for a long time. But uh, they did, my dad, for some of his time, he was in the, the intellectual uh, barrack where he, there was a bunch of professors 
and other students. Uh, and they would have lectures, which were not allowed. They'd have music. And they would post a sentry. And the sentry would, would, uh, they would have a system of knocks. And they would pass it down. And of course, uh, uh, you know, everything, by the, the time the German came, everything would be hidden. And they would be you know, doing <coughs> innocuous, uh, uh, innocuous activities. But um, there was yeah, there's a, a French professor that found out that my dad, when he was arrested, had a French uh, a book of plays with him. And it was locked away in a detention part of camp. And this guy used his connections to get the French book. And uh, he and my dad would find a quiet place and read these plays to each other. And it was a great uh, uh, source of solace to both of them. <coughs> Well, the, there was no reason. Uh, the, the pretense was that they'd set fire to this building, but, uh, but the best my dad ever said was they were they were arrested. They were students. Students are kind of uh, subversive, you know. But no no reason. And then they started releasing them the summer after. Just a couple here, a couple there, and there's no reason to that. They stopped trying to. <coughs> ascribe reason to what the what the Germans were doing in terms of shuffling them around and moving them. Okay. I think the reason was not to allow them to do any crazy things or start counter. Uh, yeah, their students are subversive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they can they couldn't recruit them into the army. I think that was the because of the law, international law, Germans ab abided that. <coughs> Same happened in, in other parts of Eastern Europe. Yep. Okay, this is night. Uh, they were crowded in there. Um, and when my dad came, his number was uh, a 9,000 number. When he left 13 months later, it was 17,000. Uh, not all, it wasn't, doesn't mean that there were 8,000 people, more people, because some people got shuffled away and, and all that. But in, the, in his time there, they just kept cramming more and more people. And uh, nighttime was uh, quite a thing, all those people crammed together. OK, this was a German punishment. They call it Hinegen. And it's kind of like a push-up. They would uh, be outside, and then uh, upon orders, they'd have to dive down in the mud. Uh, the Germans hoped there would be mud that they were in, and they would have to kind of crawl on their elbows. And sometimes this would go on and on. Uh, my dad says that one of the one time, one of the older guys, a guy in his 40s, collapsed and died. And they were he, they were young. Most of the guys he was with, they were young, and they recovered pretty quickly. But it was it was uh, pretty pretty hard stuff. The, the title of this photo is a there was a couple a book that had some photos that were illegally taken inside Grini. This one says Transporten die Sven, the the it's got a looks like a wheelbarrow there and it's in uh, the transports in full swing there. Because that was with whatever they were doing, carpentry or farm work or or uh, uh, cleaning or moving things, they sabotage it by doing absolutely as little as possible. And uh, uh, when the German guards came, then of course they looked busy. But it, as soon as they left, they were they were like that. And um, the German guards, at this point in the war, they were not exactly the cream of the crop. Uh, yeah, so they, they, if they weren't on the front, then they were because they were yeah they were they were not front worthy. <laughs> this was a, a, a guard. It was nicknamed Bestified Grandfather. Okay, there it says fought and over. Uh, the danger's over, as in the German guards left, so they can just <coughs> stand around instead of working. 
Okay, I'm jumping ahead here. Uh, this is the last lineup of Gini, probably on, you know, uh, uh, the war was over on May 8th, 1945, so this was, I don't know, May 8th or May 7th or something, but this is uh, a picture of the, the very last one in Norway. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What is the English word for upgrade? What is, is it? Uh, like are you standing at attention? Yeah, you're standing at attention. Roll call, someone Roll call. said. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, when when I was in Norway last, we went to a Gini Museum, uh, the Museum of Gini. It's a pretty new museum, it's pretty small. I just looked at their website, it doesn't seem like it's grown at all in the last five years. But uh, my dad never went there, he wasn't around. I, I think he was there when he had last been in Norway. But uh, I might check it out next time I go. Here's, they were building a replica barrack. Uh, so presumably they're done with that, although I didn't see a picture of that on their website. Okay, um, my dad on at the a pet at the roll call uh, on December twenty third, nineteen forty four. They called his name over the loudspeaker, and that meant he got to go free, and so he was able to make it home for uh, Christmas, Christmas Eve, and uh, in Scandinavia. Christmas is celebrated on Christmas Eve, so you know that was, of course, the best uh, Christmas present his parents could have got. And so he, uh, uh, his parents thought that he he looked pretty well. In fact, he was kind of uh, kind of bloated, a little fleshed out because of all the water in his diet, water and potatoes. Uh, they kind of made fun of him because he would. Uh, he would knock on the door inside the house every time he came to a door because that's what they did in the prison camp to show that they were Germans because Germans did not. And so they, they cured him after, of that after a few weeks. Um, he went to uh, work for a farmer because if he hadn't signed up to do work for, for getting food, he was in danger of being a uh, 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 pressed into service for the German, uh, the German cause. So he did that, and within a couple, I don't know how long, not that long, uh, someone from the home front came to him and asked him if he would join the resistance, and he said yes. And at this point, think about it, it's uh, early 1945, the writing is on the wall, so it's, it's not a... Uh, um, uh, like it would have been earlier in the war when really things were hanging in the balance. Uh, so he joined the resistance. And some of you have certainly heard some stories of the Norwegian resistance. There's some amazing ones. There's uh, one of the most famous is the heavy water, uh, the, the sabotage uh, of the water necessary uh, for making uh, atomic bombs. That's an amazing story. You should check it out if you don't know it. The one one that uh, my son and I are reading out, out loud right now is uh, the story of Jan Balsedu. The book is called Defiant Courage, and maybe the single most amazing story I have uh, that's come out of the whole World War II that I've ever heard about. And uh, an Olympia author wrote uh, a, another book about that. 10 years ago, Ospie Colson Scott, and she came here to the Friday Night Lecture Series and talked about her book, Defiant Courage. Uh, so there, there are some amazing missions and stories that came out of the war. My father's uh, mission was the moving of the typewriter. <laughs> and uh, the typewriter is part of the uh, underground network of communication newsletters. The legal newsletters were uh, uh, made and distributed, and in order to help that, the resistance asked him to move the typewriter. And so he did it by bicycle. And 
I don't exactly know, but from I reread his description of it, I don't think, even though typewriters were kind of suspicious, he put it on his handlebars and he had to get it across the county and he had to go past <laughs> a, a, a German police station. And he decided, you know, if he's look like looking guilty, he just has to look bored and casual with a typewriter and my <laughs> fast. But anyway, <laughs> mission accomplished. <laughs> so this is uh, an airdrop uh, parachute supplies came in. Uh, uh, and this must be in the final days in the war that happened in the daylight. Uh, my dad did not take this picture. Uh, a friend of his did. And uh, here you can see uh, parachutes. The silk was in high demand. They used that for clothes or, you know, all, all sorts of things. And here's, see him opening the canisters, food, uniforms, uh, uh, weapons, and in fact, sleeping bags. And there was one artifact uh, that made it to our house uh, in Bremerton, Washington, and that was a World War II mummy bag. And it was uh, kind of cool. I, I slept in it at least once as a kid. And then when my parents moved out of the house and were, you know, cleaning up World War II mummy bag. What do you do with the World War II mummy bag? You know, can't really throw it away, but man, it's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, me being me, I put it on Craigslist with a full disclosure explanation. Needs a good home, free, and some guy came and was really psyched about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it went away. <laughs> not, not my life. Was that a fur bag? It was not fur. It was. It was. Uh, canvas. It wasn't as rough as canvas. It was. I don't know. That might be cotton. It wasn't very warm. It was nasty. You guys are okay. This was taken on May 7th, 1945. The was uh, uh, May 8th, so it was the day before. And here they, here they are, getting, getting ready to take over. Uh, they have kind of homemade armbands. They have thrown together the best kind of uh, military-looking clothes that they have, and they've got their guns out. This is my dad right there. And, uh, this is what I like. Here's my dad off to the left. And, uh, you know, I just have never seen my dad with a gun in his hand. He's not, he's not, he's not a gun guy. And so I'm like, so, so dad, did you, go, did you shoot the gun? And he's like, yeah. I mean, he, he had, his training consisted of uh, heading out in the woods and popping off a few rounds. So, uh, there he is, man. The home front. Don't mess with him. <laughs> so on May 8th, they went to their presumably pre-planned parts of the town of Eightsville and took over. This is the Nazi headquarters, the National Assembly, and uh, two stalwart members, two <coughs> tough members of the home front. <coughs> And there's uh, two more uh, in front of the train station. <coughs> and, okay, this is the, the title my dad put on this uh, in his photo album is Fos Mertes in Shevna. This was the Nazi principal of the Eitzvah Lanskimas, where my father went to school and where my grandfather had been a teacher and presumably had been arrested when Hulse, uh, uh pointed out that my grandfather and several other guys were the rabble rousers, so they got arrested. So he's getting trundled into the back of a, of a truck and sent off to his fate. And I don't know the exact details, his fate wasn't that bad. I mean, uh, he didn't. I'm sure he was frozen out by the Norwegians, and that being ostracized in that way is no small thing. But I think he even got to keep his pension. 
I'm not, I'm not sure, but. And my, my grandfather took over. Uh, my grandfather was the next principal of that school, so that was kind of nice the way it worked out. This is a famous photo of in Akersus, uh Castle in downtown Oslo, the official uh, uh, surrender by the German officers uh, to a representative of the home front. And it's kind of funny, this picture kind of looks like my dad. It's not my dad, but my dad kind of did the same thing in Natal, where he was asked by the home front to, uh, to be the interpreter for the commander of the local forces to go to the local garrison and accept their surrender. And my dad said he had, he had considerable trepidation going in there because the Germans had lots of weaponry, they had heavy weaponry, and they were armed to the teeth, they were professional soldiers, and they were going into the lion's den to accept the surrender. And the Allied forces didn't make it to Norway until about a week after the end of the war. And that's, they had to hold down the fort for a week. And uh, so my dad went in there, they got their, you know, kind of cobbled together uniforms, and uh, they walked in there, but uh, the German commander was an absolute professional. He was sick of it, uh, he didn't want to cause trouble. And the fact is, Hitler had killed himself some days before. Hitler's orders, of course, were fight to the last man. And the, the strange thing is, there were still, I've seen different, different accounts, I've seen that there were as many as 400,000 troops in Norway at the end of the war. And, and it, it might have been less, but there, were, there was a considerable force. And uh, I still, I, maybe someone in here knows the reason why. I've heard different things uh, that, that even though it was that long after D-Day, but Hitler thought there was going to be uh, some sort of invasion from the north, and there were Russians coming down from the north. But if the Germans had decided to fight, uh, it would have been ugly and could have gone on for a long time. And more of the country might have gotten the treatment that northern Norway did as the Germans were treating and burned down every building up there. One reason there were still so many there was because the Allies did nothing to unsettle that because they didn't want them involved part of the South. No, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. it was to the Allies' advantage to yeah. to uh, faint in that direction and let them think they needed. Sort of. Okay, here is uh, the leader of the uh, Norwegian Nazi Party, Vincent Pissing. Mm -hmm. This is at his trial, mm -hmm. and uh, he was sentenced to death and executed along with a few other Norwegian traitors. Uh, there has not been an execution in Norway since. It's just one person executed. No, there was there was a few. There was a, I think less than ten, eight or. But this one they executed forty-eight of them. Oh really? Yes. Okay. Here's here's my last slide, and this uh, shows the first jeep that made it to Ace Hall, and. Uh, uh, quite a thing, you see Norwegian flag in the background. And um, before too long, my dad was assigned uh, to a, 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 a group of British paratroopers that had been sent to Norway to find, to do two things. Uh, number one, make better maps. And number two, I think, and I think their more important task was to, um, find Gestapo, which were trying to uh, hide and pass themselves as Wehrmacht. And they, they, my dad went along as an interpreter, uh, uh, he's a language guy, and he spent the summer with them. And uh, he, his stories, his, some stories of, uh, of these guys, they were, they were crazy. They, um, they were survivors of uh, Operation Market Garden, uh, there's a book and movie, A Bridge Too Far. They were British Red Devil paratroopers who got dropped ahead in advance and got stranded out there. Their, 
their casualties were tremendous. The officers that my dad uh, dealt with were guys that were in their early 20s because they had advanced so much because everybody above them had died. And they just, they just, they didn't care about, I mean, they were, they were, they were reckless young men uh, who, had, who had just seen it all. Uh, he describes a, a couple things. Um, fishing with them. How do you think they fish? Because he's kind of obvious, but uh, uh, then, the, then the, also the, the kind of attitude they had jeeps, not seatbelts, of course, and the, the kind of thing. Uh, bet you can't drive up that. <laughs> he thinks that they drove up creek beds and things that have never been driven before since. One of, one of them died. Uh, on a traffic accident because uh, they, they were driving recklessly. They were, and so he, he they were very interested in uh, finding booze, uh, finding girls, to try to, you know, uh, keep his younger sister away from them. Um, anyway, that's my last slide. I'm going to stop there and uh, take some questions. I have one. Those 450,000 people where did they house them? Norway had fewer than one million people. Then. You're talking about the, all those troops? Yes. Those uh, what, what, how did they house the 400,000 German troops that surrendered? I have no idea. Schools. Schools? Schools? Yeah. Okay. Somehow. Other questions? Yeah. How long was your grandfather imprisoned for in the north? My grandfather was uh, imprisoned in, uh, he was arrested on April 1st, 1942, and they let him go in September. So it wasn't, it wasn't that long. Um, Do you know who he actually got home from this? From? Because I always imagine from prison. Like, he wouldn't have had any entrance, right? No, did get, who got home from where? How did your dad get home from prison? Grandpa. 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 Oh, my, my grandfather got sent up to northern Norway. Oh, he it was an hour north by train from Oslo to my to Eidsvoll. I don't know how he got home. Did they, you know, when you get out of prison, they're supposed to give you some some money, a bus ticket. So, uh, I don't know. He somehow had some resources. I don't know. Later on in the 50s, he, he, he hitchhiked across the United States, so maybe he hitchhiked. I don't know. Question over here. This is the first night of Passover, so I have to ask about the attitude toward Jews in Norway and how were they treated, especially by the collaboration government? Good question. I'm not an expert on it, but I have been reading up because I'm going to give a presentation to uh, on April 15th to a group of uh, young Jewish people. And I want to be prepared. I'm not quite there yet. There were not, this is my understanding, and there's maybe people here who know better, not very many Jews in Norway. Um, in fact, uh, to Norway's shame, the Constitution, the, when it was origi originally written in 1814, it had a clause in it, an anti-Semitic clause, which, by, which had been repealed, I think, by, I don't know, I'm, I'm, uh, by 19, 1900. So there was a Jewish public population there. However, they stood out. They were not well integrated, and Norway was extremely homogenous at that time. So while there weren't very many Jews, uh, the percentage of them that were arrested and rounded up and sent to their fate in Central Europe uh, it was, uh, it was high. Um, and there, there, there are stories of, of course, uh, Jews being fair, uh, uh, whisked away to Sweden, uh, but there's nothing corresponding to the, the Danish. Uh, we really did a great thing for the Jews. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the story of, uh, of Denmark and the Jews in 1943 is really a remarkable <coughs> story. When it cracked down in Norway was, it was 1942. And, uh, the, the climate was different then, and the things were different in Denmark and Norway. But that's it. Anyway, I'm going to find out more yeah. right next time. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I comment? Uh, 
on my point about the, the Jewish issue. Uh, my name is Lake Turtle. Uh, I was a four-year-old boy when when I escaped from Rochester, Norway, with my family, and I, I have spoken right in front of you. He's right written here. a book, and he's yeah. spoken. Yeah. I, I read the book. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, the. Uh, the persecution of Jews started a long time ago, and one of the key persecutors of Jews was Martin Luther in the 1500s. Norway, uh, in 1851, declared that Norway was Lutheran, but would reject the persecution of Jews because Jews in Norway in the 1800s helped the regions in their economy. So Norway in 1851 said that Jews will not be persecuted in 1851. So that that happened. Uh, anyway, I, I don't I don't mean to whitewash the whole thing. But, but that did happen uh, uh, in, in Norway. World War II uh, was catastrophic, of course. Uh, in Norway, the Protestant churches in Norway declared that we will not be anti-Semitic. And that, that held out. So I just, I just want to say that. Okay, thanks for clarifying the 1814 to 1861. Question in the back. Lights. Lights. Take a couple more questions. Question over here. Were you, uh, was your father able to communicate to his family that he was alive and well, or alive anyway? Yes, he was. he was. He They were allowed to write a letter once a month. Although they couldn't write about anything, just the weather. <laughs> but they got the. But there was also an illegal communication, an underground communication network. There were guards that could be bribed to bottle booze. He got a secret care package from his parents of some food and some clothes and stuff. So so they, they knew uh, eventually. I don't know how long it was before they found out. Yes? I just had one comment about the, the Jews. My, my father, um, Tor Leishav, was involved in the early, in the underground from quite a young age, uh, before the time his um, occupation started. Uh, throughout the war, he was um, between the ages of 16 and 20. So he was in school, but still involved. But I, I don't know very many stories because he would not talk that much about it, but I know a few things. And one story he told was about burying Jews across in carts, and they were buried, they were buried in some sort of farm cart. And there, um, he's so there was some active involvement in doing them across the board. No, of the, no of doubt the there are such stories. And um, he said that, I, you know, this is about the, the Jews were very separate in Norway. They lived quite separately, not very integrated in the population. And he said they were always worried whether they would stay quiet or not, or get themselves out. Yeah. Many Jews came to Sweden, and we did the best we could to house them. And my family, I grew up on a farm, and so some people were on the farm helping out for room and board. And then we, one of the ladies, all her family was dead except her. And so she was my nanny when I was a kid. Let's take another question. Um, I'm putting together a book of these type of stories, especially from the Norwegian point of view. So if you have one, please come and see me after have a break. Okay. Asri from uh, Green Lodge, the Southern Norway Lodge here, is putting, she's the cultural director there. She's putting together a book of general stories. So uh, if you got a story, she's, you don't she, have to she be, wants you, it. You don't have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.